Chapter 4 is going pretty well. <laughs> yes. We already started chapter 5. I love you guys. Welcome to statistics. Uh, we 5 was the uniform probability. We talked about the dartboard, right? That led into the rectangles. Okay. All right. So maybe we haven't quite gotten into chapter four homework yet. Let's do. I want to do one example of a problem from uh, chapter four homework um, that kind of explains more about what the hell we use x p of x tables for in real life. Believe it or not, those are used in real life. Um, we. Do you guys know what happens? I think age has changed now, but it used to be when somebody turned 25, something magical happened to your car insurance. I think somebody told me it's now 26. I haven't double checked that. 26, you're bumped off your parents. It's either 26 or something else? Okay, so 26 is the age. Okay. Yes. Stay with me. Why do you think that is? Whatever that age is, why do you think your insurance goes down, your rates go down? Yes? I like that. Using the word statistically, I love it. It's a little tear. All right. Yes, so what they could do and what they have done is they would create a table and they would say, okay, for somebody who is less than 20 whatever, 26, 25, whatever the hell it is, what are the possible payouts and what's the probability of each of those? Are you guys sort of with me? So if they expect, uh, they'll have to pay out 100 bucks and that's, I don't know, 30% of the time, $1,000, 50% of the time, $5,000, whatever, right? Just making shit up, but obviously, there's somebody who works at an insurance company. There's somebody who works at a lot of companies. It's called sort of the financial analyst or something, and they just keep track of the current probabilities in this case, or the current um, demand and supply and so forth. Then they figure out what to set things at, what price to set things at, what rate to set this at. Are you guys sort of with me? So if they figure out, on average. Uh, how much money they'll actually have to pay out, they can then set a rate so that they'll more than make that back. Does that make sense? So if they expect on average to pay $250 per person, they'll set the rate at like $300. Does that make sense? Let me say this again. If they calculate it and they figure out for each person that takes their insurance, they're going to expect to pay out on average $250 per person. Are you with me? So some people they'll pay more for, and some people they'll pay zero because these people are lucky and don't get an accident. Sorry, with guess with me at all? Okay. So if they expect that each person that gets their insurance they'll end up paying two fifty on average, they will charge everybody three hundred dollars on average. So they'll make back plus extra. Does that make any sense? They want to make sure that they make profit. So they see. How much do we expect to have to pay out? And then we'll charge everybody an, a rate that makes sure we get that and more back. Does that make sense? That's an immediate real world example of this. Obviously, any real world example is gonna be a little more complicated than what we look at because we're in stats one. <laughs> yes? So in real world, there's a little more, there's a few more variables, blah, 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 but essentially it boils down to this. Okay, maybe. So there's a problem in the homework that's about, uh, let me throw it up here on the overhead. Um, uh, a game somebody's playing where you get so much money you could pick, a, pick the right card. Of course, I don't think anybody here has done the homework yet, but let's, let's take a look here. There it is, right there, beautiful. Gotta turn something on to make it work, Jeff, damn it. Okay. 
<laughs> there we go. So it's number 35 and 36 in the homework. To read through, they're both the same problem, they just have different questions. Read through 35 there real quick. Fascinating, riveting stuff. How many possible outcomes are there if you play this game? Two. You win or you lose. Now, in a more complicated problem, you could actually like, there could be a grand prize and a second prize and whatever, and then a loss. And the highest probability will of course be the loss. That makes sense. How would I start to set this up? I could create a table out of this because then I can then calculate the expected value. Anything, any casino game, for example, will have a negative expected value for us. Why? Who set the game up? Freaking casino. And what do they want to do? Make money. You with me? So, like, uh, if you play a certain slot machine, maybe it's got a negative a dollar fifty expected value. So every time somebody plays. They will lose on average a buck fifty. Are you with me? So maybe this one person down there just won ten thousand dollars, and the lights go off and such, and they love that shit because that makes more people play, and all of these people are gonna lose. <laughs> so overall, on average, they're making money. How much? About a buck fifty for every person who plays. Are you guys sort of with me? That's why they don't. They actually love it if somebody wins big. Because that generates enthusiasm, and then that just more money comes in. You're with me, okay? And of course, casinos you get free drinks. I understand because they want you to have low uh, cognitive ability, so that's why the drinks are free. <laughs> anyway, sorry. You guys ever been to a casino before? I don't blame you. They're very depressing. <laughs> These people smoke, and just they used to have to pull some. Now it's just push a button. All that aside, sorry. <laughs> In this problem, what are the two outcomes? Win loss, that's English, 11. English is not good for calculations. If you win, how much do you make? 30 bucks. 30 bucks. You win 30 bucks. If I lose, what happens? So, what would I put here? Negative two. Negative two. Love it. So, now I just got to calculate the probability. So, to win, I have to pick a face card, correct? So now you just gotta figure out the probability of that. How many cards have faces on them? 12. 12, good, three per suit, jack, queen, king, times four is 12. Out of how many cards? 52, I love it. So you can calculate these probabilities, correct? Are you with me? Then you multiply across, add down, and you see the expected value. So if the expected value is positive, I expect to make money over time. So the more I do it, the more money I should get. Bless you. I could lose money sometimes, but I should gain more money over time. Does that make sense? If it has a negative expected value, over time I should lose money. The more of a gambler you are, the more you gravitate towards those because they normally have higher potential payouts with a very low probability. Are you with me? That's why it's got a negative expected value, but if you win that one time, you can get like $10 million or whatever. Again, the casino doesn't mind, because all these other people are playing the damn game. They're making money off of those losers, right? Okay, maybe. Maybe. All right, so I just want to help you out with uh, one of the homework problems. Uh, notice this one says, what's the expected value? And this one says, should you play the game? This one's a little bit subjective. If I have any gamblers out there, you might say, even if it's a negative expected value, you might say, yeah, I'm gonna give it a try, man. So let me ask you this. If um, there was a game that cost you nothing to play and you have a chance to win $1,000 or lose 50 cents, would you play that game? Yeah. Shit, yeah, I didn't even tell you what the probabilities are. I would play the damn game and I'm a teacher, shit. I could stand to lose a few quarters, right? Because I have a chance to win $1,000. What if I do this now? Right? College students, teachers, we start to go, 
50 is actually a lot relative, right? You guys kind of with me? And I haven't even told you probabilities. Now, if I go back to this and I say the probability of this is one out of a billion, <laughs> and the probability you, you lose, I'm still going to play that game a little bit because every time I lose, I'm only going to lose 50 cents. But if I do this now, I'm definitely not playing if the probability of winning is a one over a billion. Are you with me? Because the rest of it would be the probability. Now, what if I said this? The probability of winning is one third. So the probability you lose is two thirds. Some of you guys might actually start to consider doing it now. One third is pretty good. Do you guys agree? So that's why expected value takes into account both the amount x and the probability p of x. If I do x, p of x, and add them together, that's taking both of those into account, right? You guys kind of follow. So when I put all that stuff together, in fact, if we did this, let's see, 1,000, now I'm curious about this game I just created. One-third chance and a losing 50 is a two-thirds chance. If I do x, p of x, I would get 1,000 thirds, and here I get minus 100 thirds. When I add those together, I get 900 thirds. I expect to make $300 each time I play. So if somebody set this game up, they did not set it up well at all, right? It's not balanced. There's a huge payout, huge compared to the loss. You guys agree with me? That's big compared to this, correct? But there's only a half as much of a chance to, to win. So they're going to expect to lose. If a lot of people play this game, they're going to lose a lot of money. Do you guys, do you guys follow? Because whoever set this game up doesn't understand probability and statistics. They screwed themselves over. Okay. What would have to happen for something to be a fair game? What do you think would have to happen for something to be called a fair game? Is it fair? Is this fair to everybody involved? This is unfair to the person running the game. Do you agree with me? What if it was negative 300? It would be unfair to the person playing the game, correct? So a fair game would be one where the expected value is zero. That means neither side. And of course the gamblers would go, that's boring as shit, <laughs> right? But that would be called a fair game. Okay, okay. So get into chapter four, try problems so you have questions. I just asked the question for you because that would be a really good question. If I don't get a question on a problem like this, I'm like to myself, nobody's doing the homework or everybody's skipping that problem, right? Because that is a weird problem when you first come across it. I think there's another one in here like that, uh, but I'll wait and see if you guys do it. And, uh, all right. Anything else specific from homework stuff? I, I, I think that was a no, okay, okay. All right, so back to where we left off. So this might surprise you, but I have a handout. <laughs> That's obviously sarcastic. Uh, or facetious. Oh, let's do this. So last time we got into uniform probability a little bit. What does a uniform probability distribution look like if I graph it? True, what shape does it take on? Rectangle, there we go. And all of the probability questions will be little slices of that. So uniform probability problems are inherently easy because they just boil down to finding areas of rectangles. So if I tell you I have a uniform probability that goes from 7 to 15, can you guys draw that for me real quick? Very stable. Poor little dude. I'll just do that. Yeah. This room is 
so weirdly set up. And that's the way the book is going to refer to some stuff like this. It's going to have the, the distribution out front and then the two main things. So for a uniform, the two most important things are where does it start, where does it end? So the U means uniform? U means uniform, kick ass. So we're going to see like uh, the book is going to have B. What do you think that stands for? By no me okay. Binomial. And the two most important things to know about a binomial. Let's see if you guys are with me on this. What are like? Can anybody tell me for a binomial what the variables are? Q P Q N. I love it. The two most important things that somebody has to tell me for a binomial are N and P. Why don't they have to tell me Q? If I know P. I automatically know Q, right? Because it's just one minus that. Are you with me? And then later we're going to see this, N. Anybody have any idea what that's going to be? I'm like, please tell me I wore that shirt. <laughs> just now I was like, did I put that shirt on? Normal. Yes. So it's going to be normal, and then the two most important things will be mean and standard deviation. Just to show you, I always forget to talk about the notation the book uses. This is not standard notation. This is this book. Okay. So this one, what do you guys draw? Seven and fifteen. Seven and fifteen. And a rectangle. Rectangle. And to make this complete, you have to indicate the height, right? How wide is this? Eight. So how tall must it be? One eighth. Because the area has to be. What's the area have to be? One. That works too, Joe. It's got to be one. Okay, I like it. So if I want to make a visualization of a probability distribution, in table form, the probabilities have to add to be one. So visually. The area has to be the one. Same idea. I love it. So now if I ask you, what's the probability that it's anywhere from 8 to 11? Sorry. People are deeply sighing. What in my life has led me to this? All right. Yeah, well, it can't be three. That's too big for a probability, right? So you got eight, you got 11, and then it's just a matter of finding this area, right? So questions to probability problems related to uniform always boils down to find the area of a rectangle. And again, I really, the idea of a dartboard is so perfect. So why is it so impressive to get here consistently? Because it's a very small probability that you would get there if you don't know what the shit you're doing. It's a very small area, so it's really impressive if I continuously get there. So the area is the probability if the whole area is one. Yes? So the answer to your example problem is one? Like you said, the area of seven and 15, or you continue in the problem, so. All right, this is the distribution. This is the first problem. Yeah, this is not a problem. This is just, they gave me this distribution. So the probability from 8 to 11, what's the width? 3 times the height, that'll give me the area, right? 3 times 1, 8. 3, 8, which is Point three seven five, yes, or thirty seven and a half percent chance. Okay. Not many things are uniformly distributed in real life, right? But there, it's a nice. So there's not a ton of uniform distributions in the world. 
but there are a couple key places where we use this idea. And it's a really good way to segue into this guy, right? Normal distributions. Um, can somebody tell me, all right, somebody tell me the main difference between a binomial and a uniform distribution? If I wanted you to, could you come up with a binomial problem? What do they look like? Binomial probability problems. What do they look like? I love you guys so much. What were the variables again? N, N P, Q, X, right? What did X mean? No, just the, the exponent. Number of successes? Yeah. N was the total number of things, so forth, right? So what kind of problem would it be? You have to give a total number of things and a probability of success, correct? So I could say, 38% uh, of people like, uh, 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 I don't know, waking up late. Um, uh, we take 80 people. Okay, there's N, there's P. Are you with me? Could I have 1.9 people like something? Could 1.9 people like something? No! I don't, the 0.9 person. What? Okay. Agree with me. So what kind of distribution is that? Is it continuous or discrete? Binomial is discrete because it could be zero, one, two, three. Yes? What kind of distribution is this? Continuous. It could be anything between 7 and 15. That's why these are like times or something continuous. Ages. Something that's continuous. Are you with me? So this is a relatively easy problem to kind of like ease us into the idea of continuous distributions. They come down to the area. Okay. What do you think about this based on what I just said? Let's see what you guys think about this. Based on everything we just did, what is probably x equals 14? Why was the answer to this one 3 eighths? Why exactly? Tell me geometrically why. What was the answer to this three eighths geometrically? The space in between the two numbers is three. So instead of the word space, the or the width. The height? Area. Or the area. I'm like, put all that stuff together. Some of it. You're like, I'm gonna get there. Something. The area was three eighths. Everybody with me? Okay. Now think about the question I just asked. Probability x equals fourteen. I love you so much. Bless you. So, where, so can you draw 14 on here? There it is. The answer to a probability question in a uniform distribution is the area. What is the area of that line I just drew? How wide is it? Very small. Not just very small. I love you guys so much. That line goes from what to what? It goes from 14 all the way up to 14. Yeah. No, it's not. The question isn't between 14 and 15, is it? The question is equals 14, yes? Now, of course, I just made it wider, but oh well. It goes from 14 to 14. How wide is it? Zero. zero. So that is zero. Now, let me see if you guys can handle this. Remember last time I asked you how many numbers there are? How many numbers are there in this, on this axis here from 7 to 15? How many numbers are there? No, is 4.765 a number? Oh, oh. Okay, okay. so okay. between 7 and 15, and includes like 7.89743299? Infinite. Infinite, everybody with me? Infinite. So if I had an infinite number of chips in a bag, and I have seven blue chips in there, are you with me? And the rest of them are red. <laughs> What's the probably pick a blue chip out? Very small. Zero. Zero chance. Because it would be 7 divided by infinity. Are you with me? Okay, I love it. I love it. So the probability of a specific number showing up when I have a continuous distribution is 0. And if you just stick with the idea that the answer to a probability is the area, the area of a line is 0. It's got no width to it. You guys with me? 
right, you're all looking at me, this is good. But most of you look at me like, start making sense. Answer to a probability question when I have a continuous, when I have the picture, is the area related to that question, always. Area here was nice. It's got a width, it's got a height, beautiful. Area of x equal 14, there can't be an area. It's got no width to it. The other way to look at it is there's an infinite number of things I could pick. So let's probably pick a specific thing. Zero. Is everybody semi-cool with what just happened? So I'm going to go one step further, and this next step you really don't have to get, but I just want to throw this out there in case anybody's curious. How do I say this? Again, if this doesn't make any sense, it's fine. This probability is not actually zero, it's actually the next number up from zero. Which is called, what's the biggest positive number? What's the only thing you could tell me if I asked for the biggest positive number? What, what do you tell me? Huh? A trillion. Infinity. Raise that to the trillionth power. Oh. Isn't that a little bit bigger? What is the biggest positive number? Yes. The only thing you can say is infinity. That's not a number, but just freaking there's no biggest. It's just infinite, right? Based on what we just said, wouldn't every slice of this have a zero chance, right? But if I add them all up then, don't I still get zero? So technically, this is not really zero. It's something called, and again, what did I say? What did I say about everything I'm saying right now? It's extra shit. But I just want to throw this out there in case anybody's curious. Iota, something called iota which is the smallest, which is basically the smallest positive number. So what do you think the smallest positive number is? A lot of zeros and maybe like one, like one, somewhere, down the line. So if you think it's point 0.1, couldn't you cut that in half? Or not point 0.1, but like, you know, like a bunch of zeros and then one. Yeah. Sure, a bunch of zeros and then one. Couldn't you cut that in half? Yeah. Do you see how, just like infinity, if you think you got the biggest number, couldn't you just raise it to itself? Isn't it bigger, or just double it, isn't it bigger now? So what's the smallest positive number? Whatever you think, couldn't you just cut it in half? Couldn't you just do that forever? Okay, I'll stop, I'll stop, I'm sorry, I'll stop. So for us humans, we are all human here, the answer to this question is zero. In case anybody was curious, and I really hope some of you guys would not because if I add up all the probabilities, it's supposed to equal 3 eighths for this, right? But if each of them has a probability of zero, how does that happen? They're not actually zero. They're like right above zero. I'll stop. So officially, when I ask you this question, you could just say zero. Everybody with me? Because even if I saw 0 0.703, I would call that zero. Most of us would call that zero. Are you with me? Your calculator would just say zero because it's way too far for it to show that on your screen. Are you with me? Okay, maybe, maybe. Okay. So, so what about this? Um, what's the probability that x is greater than 15? This one's a little more straightforward. What's the probability it's greater than 15? What's the highest thing that this problem says can happen? So it's probably is greater than 15. Zero. Done. What's probably is less than 15? Uh, a number. If you go less than 15, do you leave any of it out? You get the whole thing. So let me ask you again. What's probably x less than 15? Everything. Everything, which translates to what percentage? 100% chance. If the probability greater than 15 is no chance, less than 15 has to be 100% chance, right? So if I give people up to 15 minutes to finish a quiz, and it normally takes people from 7 to 15 minutes, the probability it takes somebody more than 15 minutes is zero, because I'm going to take the damn quiz away from them, right? 
And it probably takes them less than 15. Is 100%. Everybody takes less than 15 minutes because I, don't, I only give them 15 minutes. Does that make sense? Okay, I like it. I like it. Okay, okay, okay. Um, One little thing that's going to show up in the homework. I got a question. Over yes, you. go ahead. So when you say it's less than 15. Probability that if I pick something in from this distribution, it's less than 15. Okay, that's what I was thinking. It's 100% it chance. Because it could be anywhere from 7 to 15, so probably it's less than 15, it's 100% chance. Yes? It couldn't be equal to 15? Ah, okay, I was waiting to see. Equal something is zero. So real quick, real quick, just because you asked that, this is related to a bonus problem I'm going to put somewhere. Um, this question is the exact same as this question. Because what's the only thing this adds to this? equal to 15, but what's the probability of x equal to 15? Zero. Zero. So it adds nothing. So the answer to both of these would be 100%. Wait. Okay. I know. You said the bottom one is 100%? Both of these is 100%. Because how much does equal to 15 add? Nothing. Oh, because it's both. I guess. Okay. All right. I love it. You guys look oppressed. Oh, boy. Okay. Again, uniform in general. Most of the problems you're gonna get, let's do one more problem with this thing. Just take a minute and see, can you answer this question? This is a, a no tricks, no nothing, no weird shit. Uh, 10 less than X, less than 14. Using that. Same pro same distribution, yeah. Don't say anything. There's only a couple of things that are a little bit weird, but they all relate to the area that you catch. If it's equal to seven, I don't catch any area. If it's below the highest, I catch the whole area. That's why I was zero and 100. Uh, what did I say? 10? So what's the area? So it's a very visual problem. What's the area of the rectangle I just shaded it, which is this, right? What is it, sir? 50%. 50 four out of eight, right? Four times one eighth. So it's a 50% chance. Cash. Now. What did I say every time I give us a different distribution, a different data, way to look at data? So we had a list of data. So we came up with some formulas. We had x and p of x. We changed some formulas. What are the two most important things, no matter what way they give me data? What are the two things I want to be able to calculate? Mean and standard deviation, kick ass. I like it, All right? The most boring game of charades ever. Okay. We have a uniform distribution now. Uh, I'm going to take this away. Is that right? Can somebody tell me what they think the average is? Is anything more likely than anything else? They're all the same likelihood. So what do you think the average is? Sometimes I'll get seven. Sometimes I'll uh, you know round seven. Sometimes I get eleven point oh seven four nine. Sometimes I get something. What do you think the average is? You can do this, you can do it. So this would be like um, waiting for a bus or something. Anywhere from seven minutes to 15 minutes or whatever. What's the average amount of time somebody would wait? It's anywhere from seven to 15, all equally likely. So what would the average amount of time be? looking at like just do it man all right in the middle right okay now some of you guys are like yeah that's what I was saying to you in my eyes when I was looking at you um and what's that of course six I'm tripping eleven you're totally tripping how about you so eleven's right in the middle right is this four away four away is that cool so in general the mean for a uniform distribution is A plus B divided by two, where A and B are just where it starts, where it ends. Is that cool? 
You're going to see this in the homework. Uh, I might give it to you in one practice test for one specific reason, but otherwise, I'm not too concerned about this because you don't see uniform curves very often. But I, I at least I want to make a complete picture. Every damn time we get a distribution, we have to have a way to get the mean and the standard deviation. Now I'm going to write down the standard deviation formula. Standard deviation is almost always involves calculus to figure out, and I don't think a lot of us in here have taken calculus. If you have, I could actually show you the derivation if you want to see it. But here's the standard deviation formula. I want us to get your first reaction to this. to me that they're cool with it. I like it. Anybody, anything strike you about that? Something from pre-comp, I remember what it's called. Oh. Uh, is there an equation that is similar to that? It feels like there is, but I can't, I don't think it's quite like this. I'm thinking like distance formula or something, but it's not that. All right, I'm a little, anybody ever watch, uh, real quick guys. You don't have to watch any shit prerequisite for this course. Anybody ever watch Doctor Who at all? Doctor Who. One person. Okay. Well, about it. All right. I'm not going to talk about it. But you know, hey, real quick. Uh, it's bigger on the inside, right? So, right? Yes. You watch Doctor Who. All, all of them. All of them. Anyway, I'm sorry. All of them. So basically, he's got a spaceship. It looks like a police box. It's like a phone booth, basically. And when you walk into it, it's much bigger than it looks like. So the doctor's always waiting for somebody to say, when they walk in, they go, oh, shit, it's bigger on the inside, right? And when they don't say that, he's a little disappointed. Here, I, I just want somebody to go, why 12? Why, why 12? Where'd 12 come from? And nobody did, but that's okay. That's all right. You guys didn't know what, you're like, I don't even know what to begin with this shit, Jeff. Anyway, so there is a derivation. It does involve calculus. There is a reason it's 12. But for your purposes, it's just something to plug and chug into. So what would the standard deviation be for us? It would be 7 minus, I'm sorry, 15 minus 7 is 8, squared is 64. Whatever the hell that is. Square root of it, yeah? Yeah, thanks, man. So it should be about 2 point you something maybe? Two point three oh nine. Two point three oh four? Yeah. Okay. The, no, two point three oh nine. Yeah. Two point three oh nine? Yeah. Okay. Alright. So that means that the middle is at eleven. And on average they get two point three oh nine away from that. Same thing as it always means. So you will see a few homeworks that ask you the mean and standard deviation, but in general, I am not overly concerned about it. So that's as much as I'm going to spend talking about that, unless you come and ask me for the derivation of this. Okay. So that's chapter five. Chapter five, two sections. Chapter six, two sections. Chapter seven, I think it's three. I can't remember off the top of my head. Two, three. Um, yep. All right, so we're going to slowly make our way into chapter six. And to do this, I'm going to give you. Actually, wait a minute. That's right. Before we do chapter six, I do have a little bit of a practice sheet. Do number two first. 
And I'm not gonna force you into groups, but if you wanna work with other people, feel free. And if you need to borrow a calculator, just come up. We could do that. I'll tell you what. So don't do the side that's got like the Mayan pyramid on it. Do the other side. Binomial uniform practice, yes? Oh. Where is my... Getting low on battery. Let's see what happens. Yeah. yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> All right, guys, let's take a look here. Let's do the second problem first, since that's what I had you guys do. Um, so when you draw this distribution, it's going to look like a big old rectangle. So it's going to go from 22 to 39. Anybody figure out how tall it's going to be? 1 over 17. Kick ass. Yeah. Only be surprised when you get it wrong. All right. So far, so good? Once you get that sucker set up, then you can answer any question after that. So now I ask you between 23 and 27. So if I kind of, I can redraw it or I can just use the same one, but... 23 and 27. It doesn't have to be the scale, obviously. So what's the area that going to be? 4 times 1 over 17. 4 seventeenths, which is... 0.235? 3? Okay. Remember, probability... Four decimal places. Kick ass. What's probably takes a student more than 22 minutes? 100%. Yeah, if you shade everything that's above 22, don't you shade the whole damn thing? 100%. Kick ass. And then the probably X is eight. Zero, for two reasons. Right? I didn't really pick a great number, but oh well. Eight's not even in here, so it didn't even have a chance. But even if this was x equal 28, it would still be zero, correct? Because there's no area to that. I like it. Let me throw in one more question. Um, x greater than 37. Nope. That's all right. 37's right here, right? Two over 17? Yeah. Greater than 37, so anything above 39 doesn't add anything. So it's basically 37 to 39. So the area of that would be 2 over 17, which would be point. Uh, you could do a Jeff. 1, 1, 7, something. 6, six. six 4? Yeah. Sure, right, all right. I did okay. That's good. Good enough for government work. Okay. Now, so is that okay? I mean, uniform, there are a couple of homework problems. And let me, let me throw one thing at you just to get you ready for this homework problem. Um, what if I said the probability that X is less than 25 given that X is... Uh, greater than 24. I like it. Oh, shit. So here's the easiest way to do this kind of problem, which you will see 
one time in the homework. And I have given myself exactly no room to do this. I love it. Given that x is greater than 24, the picture changes now. So now it starts where? 24. And goes up to... No, it doesn't go up to 25. Given that x is greater than 24, so it goes from 24 to 39. Used to start at 22, now it starts at 24. You with me? What's the height now? One fifteenth, and now I can do less than twenty-five. What's the width? One times one over fifteen, so one fifteenth. And then whatever that is, you need to divide it. Uh, yes. Oh, here? There. Yes. Greater than 37. Okay. Yeah, so it's only got a width of 2 within this. Anything above 39 adds nothing, correct? It's like if I ask you, what's the, I have a normal die, yes? It's invisible. But I can tell. What's the probability I roll more than a 5? One, 1 out of 6, yes? Well, why didn't you just... Why not just keep going? Because it can go up to 6. That's it. So probably more than 37, it can only go up to 39. Right? So just like with a die, it can only go up to 6. So if I say what's well, probably more than 5, that's just one thing it could do. 6? Okay, maybe, maybe, maybe. Oh, uh, this part? Or the, which part? The... This one? No, the other one. The other one. This one. No. The one we just did. This one. No, your other piece of paper. Yeah, the one we just this did. This one. Okay, okay. Sorry. I keep saying this one in the projector. I hate projectors, but oh well. Okay, so we're given that it's greater than 24, correct? So it used to be 22 to 39. Now I know it's going to go from 24 to 39. Because it's given to me that it's more than 24, right? So if I know that it's more than 24, which one of these can I throw out? I know that it's more than 24. What can I throw out of here? 22, 23, all the way up to right before 24, correct? So that's why now I'm starting at 24. And now the height would change because it only goes 24 to 39. Okay, remember. So this one, what was I given? That it goes from 22 to 39. So it's above 22 and below 39, correct? Now somebody's saying, okay, I'm going to give you now that it's more than 24. Oh, okay, so now I start at 24. I'm going to throw out everything below 24. That can't happen because I know something above 24 happened. Given that it was more than 24, what's the probability it was less than 25? Now I can do that. So when I have a uniform distribution and I have a given, I just redraw the picture. And then it just becomes a normal problem. Find the area of the right slice. Okay, maybe. Okay, you guys really love that one. Again, there's only going to be one problem like this and a slew of other problems that are going to be more standard. Okay, okay. Um, so going back up here, did you guys finish this part? No. Not yet? Okay. That might give me some more time. Uh, I'm going to try to work out my printer issue. We need that for the next half. Okay, I'll be back. Keep working on it. Remind me, what was the formula for the mean for a binomial? And what was the formula for the standard deviation? Yeah. Now, real quick, if I were you, I would have handouts sitting next to me as I was doing homework, and I would have them sitting out next to me whenever we're doing stuff. I mean, you can always just reference your notes. You can reference, right? This is not a quiz.
going to start to catch up to you. What the most important things to figure out are n, p, and q. What are those things for this problem? Two eleven is n. Yeah, point one two. Point eight eight, kick ass. And in this case, for this first problem, x is nineteen. So then what's the formula look like? 211, choose 19. So I've got 19 successes. So how many failures do I have? 192? Yeah, that makes sense, okay. All right, and let's see. So if you've got how to plug that in, 211, choose 19. If you have the newer calculator that has subscripts and superscripts, it kind of sucks because you have to hit the over arrow. 0.12, what did I just do? Times 0.12 to the 19th. Hit the over arrow to come back down. Times 0.8 to the 192. There you go. So I get 0 0.0361, 0 0.0362, thank you. So much glare in this room, okay. So about a 3.6% chance to get 19 people out of 211 that worry about this. All right, very silly worry indeed. So there, now these are just plug and chuck. And again, these are the best, holy shit, these are the best formulas. So 211 times 0 0.12. 25.32? Okay. So what that means is out of any group of 211 people, 211 uh, workers, U.S. workers, I expect around 25 to be worried about this. Okay. And now you got to do the square root of 211 times 0 0.12 times 0 0.88. Let's try to do it in your head, Jeff. Why not? Do it. Do it, math boy. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> Four point seven. 203? Yeah. Sure. Okay. Or 4.72 would be fine. I like it. All right, not too bad. So now you just take, you could do this visually if you want to. You could put 25.32 and go up and down. So if I go up two of these, where do I end up? 34.76, and if I go down two of those, 15.88. Yeah, so it's a bit arbitrary to do two, but two is nice, two is a nice whole number. Two means if it's normally distributed, there's only a 5% chance it's outside of within two, which matches with kind of like a general idea of what unusual should be. An unusual event should be something that has a low probability. <clears throat> and 5% chance of happening is definitely a low probability. Later this semester, we're going to have problems where we change what unusual means. So for example, if you work in a nuclear power plant and the needle starts moving and it hasn't gotten into the yellow yet, but it's moving towards the yellow, do you sit there and go, nah, that's not unusual yet. Just wait, just wait, just wait for it. It gets in the yellow, like, ah, we'll wait. <laughs> or are you gonna redefine your definition of unusual to be the minute that starts moving towards yellow, I'm getting my ass off. Does that make any sense? So depending on the situation, we might have to change what our definition of unusual is. Okay.
Right now, in general, we're saying it's two steps away. That's where unusual starts. So would it be unusual to find 14? Yes. Yes. That would be unusually... You don't have to say... You could just say yes. It's unusual because it's outside of two steps, two standard deviations. But you could say it's unusually low. Yes. Great question. So for the... When we do the... Like if we were to do C, if it was on like a test or a quiz or something, do we have to put the line in? No, no, no. I, uh, yeah, I should have. Or you could just do it min, max... 25.32 my, uh, minus twice this, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Yeah. You don't have to do it visually. Okay. I'm just saying if you want to do it visually, feel free. Okay, so anything from that sheet there. Okay. Okay. So let me make this official then. Quiz on uh, chapter four on uh, what is the what's the next Wednesday? Yeah, I'll have the formulas on the quiz. Test will have you guys make your own formal sheets. Quiz, I'll put the formulas on the quiz. Okay, for those of you at home, there. So let's look at this other side, this weird side with the pyramid. All right. How would you set this problem? So we're flipping a coin. We're assuming it's not weighted. So it's actually, let's say it is not weighted. It's a normal coin. So it's 50-50 chance to get heads or tails. Right? And we're going to flip it 14 times. Right? So what's N? 14. Holy shit. And what's P and Q? 0 0.5. 0 0.5 each. I like it. Take a second and see if you can set up the formula for getting exactly nine heads. So it'll be 14, choose 9. Some of you guys might realize it's a bit of a shortcut when it's 50-50, but let's just do it all the way up. 0.5 to the ninth, 0.5 to the 5th. Does anyone understand that if it's 50-50, every binomial probability is going to just have 0.5 to the 14th? Because now both the bases are the same. Do you have to do it that way? Well, obviously not. We just we we didn't do it that way here. So I'll stop talking about that. Uh, anybody put this in the calculator yet? What'd you get? Three zero five one. I'm sorry. Three zero five five. All right. Let's see. 14 choose 9 times 0.5. I'm just going to do 14 because that's what you get. So I get 1, 2, 2, 2. So let me do that just so you guys know I'm not cheating or anything. 9 times 0.5. Jeff, you got to come out of there, dude. Times 0.5 to the fifth. 1, 2, 2, 2. Is that? You can see the. Do you see? 14 choose 9? Ah, okay. So 1, 2, 2, 2. So about a 12% chance you'll get uh, exactly 9 heads if you flip a coin 14 times. I lock it. What about at least 1 head? What's the little consideration you got to do there? I get way too many people, they just put a 1 in and they're done. 
What's at least one mean? Hmm? All right, cool. At least one directly means one, two, three, four, up to 14. I'm not going to do that because I'd have to do the formula for each one of those. So I'm going to do one minus none, right? And what's the formula for no successes? Fourteen choose zero. Okay. Point five to the zero. Point five to the fourteen. So you should get something that looks vaguely familiar. You're going to get point zero zero. Zero, zero, six. All right, you should get this. E negative five means move it back five, so you move it once around the six, and then four more times, so four zeros, right? So that'll be point nan, 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 nan. Four. <laughs> okay. So if you get if you flip a coin fourteen times and you get no heads at all, is that unusual? What do you think? What's probably I get at least one head? Most of us would call this a hundred percent chance, right? It's not really a hundred percent, but it's freaking close. This is the probability I get no heads, correct? You guys with me? All right. Now, we're going to do it more officially here in a minute, but I think you guys would agree with me. That would certainly be an unusual event to not get any heads when I flip it 14 times. Okay. Does that mean it's impossible to flip nothing but tails when you flip a, a fair coin 14 times? No, of course it's not impossible. It's just really, really unlikely. This little middle section, uh, let's do this. This is where I finally sell you how to do binomial CDF and PDF. So let me show you where this is. Look above the VARS button. What do you think that stands for? Distributions. Distributions. Kick ass. If you hit it, you're going to see a few things that look familiar. Familiar? A few things that look familiar. Very first thing I see is normal, right? This is weird, this is weird, this is all weird. All of, That's really weird. If you keep scrolling down, you'll eventually get here. The difference between PDF and CDF, and I wrote this down on this paper, is PDF means particular, CDF means cumulative. So in this case, I want, for example, if I want to check this one out, I want exactly nine heads. I want a particular value. I don't want to accumulate stuff. So exactly nine heads, if I want to check it out, I could do binomial PDF. And what I, now if you have a newer calculator, it does this. Anybody, if you hit that button, does it just say binomial PDF with a parenthesis? What you're gonna to want to put in there is NPX, comma separated. Let me see if I can make mine do that. Uh, what was it, Jeff? I don't remember, there it is. Oh, I can't even do that. Oh, mode. There it is. Okay. Let me see if that does it. Go away. We have binomial PDF. Nope. Shoot. Oh well. I can't make mine look like the old, old school ones. So now we got 14 trials. 0.5, and I want nine successes. So that's what it will look like. There you go. That's what yours should look like. Now you all see why you have a comma on your math calculator, right? That's the same damn answer we got here, right? Okay, a lock it. A lock it. CDF would be if I say I want to know less than, probability is less than five or something, then you can do up to four. Okay. So this one we should know without even doing a formula. If I flip a coin 14 times, how many heads do I expect? Seven. So if I do the formula, 14 times 45, you get seven, of course. Take a minute, figure out what the standard deviation is. I 
think I know what it is. What do you guys get? 1.871. Now figure out what the minimum expected and the maximum expected. So I don't know if you guys remember, but I asked you if you flip a coin 500 times, if you get 251 heads, that's not going to freak you out because that's close to 250. Somewhere there's a line. If you get 300, will that freak you out? I don't know, maybe. <laughs> so this is going to be a more formal definition of where we should start getting freaked out. So if I flip a coin 14 times, when is it weird, the results? So if I do seven minus two of these, where do you end up? 3.2583, blah, blah, okay. So if I got three heads out of 14 flips, I can officially be concerned or freaked out is a little bit too strong of a word. That is evidence that the coin is not fair. It is definitely not proof, right? And then if I do the same thing the other way, 10.741, okay. So then if I got 11, that would be unusually high number of heads. Okay. Maybe. So again, anything, like we talked about last time with Aaron Brockovich and the whole water thing, uh, and I know I say water weird, just deal with it. Uh, there's a normal occurrence of cancer, so I can figure out what the max and minimum percentage of cancer occurrences should there be. And that, so if I see a town that's got an unusually high compared to what I expect, I want to go take a look. That doesn't mean something's happening. It could just be a random coincidence that that town has a lot of cancer. But if at the same time there's reports of weird tasting water and people not feeling well, then I'm like, all right, where are you? So then I go in there, check the water out, see what's going on. Are you guys with me? The, the H2O. Let me see it later. Water. The Sound water. British. Huh? Sound British. British? British, if I say water. Yes, okay. <laughs> I will so stop. I will so desperately stop. <laughs> Nobody knows. I don't even know. I was, I was really young when I was born. Um, <laughs> sorry. So guys, real quick, go with me. Uh, what did we get for exactly nine heads? We got 0.1222. This silly little chart that I, that I took a copy of, do you see how it rounds to three places? Because they're, you know, they're crazy. But do you see it's the same thing, right? One, two, two, two. Real quick, look at zero. What's the, pro what's the chart say for zero? Zero plus. What that means is it's just above zero. And sure enough, what did we get for zero? Just above zero. Just above zero. Point oh, 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 six. Yeah. Okay. Oh, 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 six. Okay. Now, go with me. This is what I would get if I calculated all the possibilities, right? It could be anywhere from zero to 14, correct? If I calculate all the probabilities and draw a histogram, this is what I get. Can anybody tell me the shape of this? What would you call it? Yeah, it looks normal. We're going to come back to this handout. So if any of you like throw these out or burn them or anything, maybe don't do that to this one. Make sure you have this for later. Obviously, I'll have more copies later. We're going to come back to this one because we're going to formalize a way to tell when a binomial thing is roughly normal. And, and real quick, let me see if I can just throw a little something, a little foundation down. The average was seven, right? So the highest peak might not be equal to the mean, but it's going to be close. So sure enough, in this case, it's exactly the mean. That's the highest peak. You with me? What if the mean, what if I had a weighted coin? Go with me for a minute. What if I had a weighted coin and it only had a 10% chance to show up heads? You with me? So now if I flip it 14 times, what's the average number of heads I should get? So now it's 14 and it's 0.1. 14 times 0.1, 1.4. So wouldn't the highest peak be down here at one? Do you guys see what I'm saying? Why was the highest peak here? Because the mean is seven. So right in the middle, it's got room to go up and room to go down, yes? If the mean was actually 1.4, 1.4, 1.4, 1.4, 1.4, 1.4, 1.4, 1.4, 1.4, 1.4, 1.4, 1.4, 1.4, 1.4, 1.4, 1.4, 1.4, 1
Would it have room to go up and room to come down and be a nice, no. There's not enough room. So I'll formalize that later. We'll come back to this chart later. Okay. Uh, this was me just, do you guys notice, what's the probability of four? Getting four heads? 0 0.061, right? What is the area of this rectangle? The width is one, the height is 0 0.061, isn't the area 0 0.061, which is the probability of four, yes? So this is just me really hammering home that if you have a visualization of the probability distribution, the area equals the probability of that thing. Just, just like uniform curves, yes? So here's my point. For uniform curves, slices of this thing are easy because they're just freaking rectangles. If you had to pick a shape to do geometry on, rectangle would be near the top of your list, correct? I think trapezoid would be a little further down, yes? Then you got some rhombuses and stuff. Rhombi? Romb I don't know. To be really honest, I'm not really sure. For a normal distribution, if I take a slice of this, I know I've got the answer there. If I take a slice that's not defined, this here, do you have a geometric formula for that? For that area? Do you see how it's curvy on the side? So it's like a crayon left out in the sun or something? We don't have a geometric formula for curvy on the top, do you? You guys with me a little bit? You're all like, I'm in the same room. Okay, I really want this to make sense. This one, this one, can't we just calculate the dam area? Yes. Every time, we can just calculate the dam area, just find the area. And so I can, then I can get the probability, correct? If I ask me a probability question for a normal curve, the slices aren't nice geometric shapes. Did you guys ever calculate the, sh the formula for that area? Curvy. No, of course you didn't, unless you took calculus. All right, so what we're gonna use, we're gonna have some help. We're gonna have something that somebody's created using calculus, and we're just gonna use their answers. We're not gonna suddenly have to learn calculus in the middle of statistics. So don't freak out. Um, this is where I've got to go get them. <laughs> now, oh, that's good. I, so, thanks, man. Um, before I give this to you, I want to set up a little something, see if you guys remember how to do something. Just do it on the board, Jeff. We'll do it live. You guys remember empirical rule? Yeah. Sorry, I didn't mean to get so excited. Um, so if I have a normal curve, what was the percentage within three standard deviations of the mean? So it's mu plus three sigma, mu minus three sigma. So what was it? Within one step was 68%, two. Ninety-five, three. Ninety-nine point seven. So this would be ninety-nine point seven. Two would be ninety-five, right, and so forth. Okay, so let's use this. Let's use that. That's a nice, nice number. Can somebody tell me there's ninety-five percent chance to be within two? What's the chances I'm more than two away? Five percent. Does everybody cool that? So it's probably I am more than two away just in that direction. Two and a half because it's symmetric. Everything cuts in half around the mean, correct? So are you all with me that there's 2.5% here and there's 2.5% here? So if I go two standard deviations down, if my z-score is negative two, I should have about two and a half percent below that. You guys agree? Okay, I like it. So any chart, so what I'm about to give you, you can see the edge of it, the blue chart there. Any chart I give you that tells you all the areas between any two z-scores in the normal curve 
it better freaking give me a number like this when I look up negative two. Does that make sense? So the chart I'm about to give you is gonna expand on empirical rule. Because the empirical rule, I only know one, two, three. What if I wanna know what percentage is below 1.71? Will empirical rule help me out worth anything? You know from the way I asked that question, the answer is no, it's not gonna help us out. Because it only knows one, two, three, correct? That's all it knows. So the minute is anything between there, it gives up. It doesn't know. So this, there is an area below 1.71, right? There is an area of that, and that would be the probability that I get a z-score below 1.71. But there's no way in hell I can get that from empirical rule. So what we got is we got a bunch of uh, us nerds. We programmed a computer, and we had to do some calculus, and then we wrote all this stuff down. So this is basically, if you have a normal curve, this is a sheet of all the answers. You just have to know where to look. So. Chilling here, right? And if I'm chilly, you guys must be. It's, I run, it's warmer than normal. I run hot. It's warmer than here? normal. Yeah. It's normally freezing. Really? Yeah. Oh. It's normally freezing. Weird. Well, you can always tell me that's true. I'm sorry. Take a little getting used to to read it. In order to make it just a one sheet thing, they had to do a little creative use of space. So the way this works, if I want to look up negative three point four two, negative three point four two, there it is. That would be the area below a z score of negative three point four two. Why does it make sense? It's so small. Because negative 3.42 is way the shit down here. It's going to have very little area below it, correct? So that chart, and the, and the picture at the top always tells you this, whatever z-score you look up, it tells you the area below. So for example, we know if I look up negative 2.00, I should get close to 0.025, yes? It won't be perfectly put into five because the empirical rule is kind of rounded. So let's see what we get. If I look up negative 2.00, right? I get 0228. This is roughly 025, very roughly. So we rounded the numbers. If you do the within one, it's actually a little bit better. Within one is how much? 68%, so how much is outside? 68 in, 32 out. 16. 16. So if you look up negative 1.00, it should be almost 16, and it is. If you rounded that, that'd be 16, right? Okay, okay. So you can find empirical rule numbers in this. This just expands the shit out of that. We only knew 1, 2, 3 before. Now we know all this stuff in the middle. You know, like, okay. So. Let's do a couple of quick uh, lightning round stuff here. I'll record this for the people at home. Oh, my kingdom for a piece of paper. Yeah, what are you? You're old, so okay, good. So let's say, let's see what you guys think. Let's say I'm given 
You'll see this in the homework. Given a standard normal distribution. Yes, we have crossed over into chapter six. Chapter six is all about normal curve. By the way, chapter six is the most important chapter because the minute we set stuff up from chapter six, we're gonna use the shit out of that for the rest of the semester, right? So this whole thing we're doing right now with z-scores, looking up areas that are probabilities, that's huge. We're gonna do that a lot, okay? Standard normal distribution just means it's already z-scores. So let me ask you guys a question. If they say given a standard normal distribution, what's going to be right in the middle? Sure, be more specific. If I've already changed everything to z-scores, what does the mean become? What is the z-score again? The number, standard number standard deviations from the mean to the point I'm looking at. If I'm looking at the mean, how far is the mean away from the mean? Okay. So given a standard normal distribution, find the probability that x, is, oh, sorry, not x, probably that z is less than negative 1.12. So this is officially section 6.1. is z-score section 6.2. They give us x-scores, which is where my brain went for a minute. Do we have a way to convert x-scores to z-scores? Somebody's like, no. You never told us that. Yes, that's this guy's job. Take an x-score, make it a z-score, right? So we'll see that later. Right now, we've already got z-scores, correct? And real quick, let me ask you a couple questions. When can I use this chart? Obviously, I need to have a z-score. Also, it needs to be normal. If I don't have a z-score or it's not normal, I can't use this chart. Okay, I like it. So this one is normal. I got a z-score. Can you draw the picture? What I say went in the middle? Zero. The mean, zero. in this case it's zero because everything's been changed into z-scores already, right? Now here's something that drives me a little crazy. Uh, that is a number line. Where is negative 1.112? Is it here? No. no, okay, so some people just sort of put it wherever the hell they want to. The picture's gotta make sense. Now, now look, negative 112, right? Just put it over that way. All that matters is it's on that side. You don't have to be perfect. Can you shade in the area this once? Those of you who are just staring at me, I guess your answer is no. Uh, can you shade in, what area does this want? It wants the probability, which is an area below negative 112, right? So wouldn't it just be there, right? Is that cool? Can anybody tell me anything about the area? Is it bigger or smaller than 50%? We know that because we drew the picture correctly, right? The, the mean cuts it in half, so this is definitely less than 50%. So I at least know if my answer is 0.739, I'm like, that's wrong, the shit that I do. Now, can you guys take a minute, <laughs> take a minute and look that up? You got the z-score chart, so look up that area. Don't say anything. So basically, this goes to the first decimal place and this is the second decimal place, right? So again, it's a little bit like a street map. You gotta get used to it. Negative 1.1. And this is where you gotta remember, this sucks. People do this sometimes, one, two, but that's not right because it starts at zero, right? So negative 1.1, zero, one, two. So you guys get that, 13, 14? So there is 13.14% in there. So if your Z-score on a test or something was negative 1.12 and it's normally distributed, 13.14% of the people scored below you. What idea is that connected to that we talked about earlier? 
13, about 13% is below that. So that is the 13% is below that. So what is that score? That would be the, what thing have we talked about where it was always a percentage below? We've done this. Related to SAT scores, and we had that girl Mina in the, in the DMV, huh? Percentiles. So this would also be called roughly the 13th percentile, right? You guys see that? This is the 13th percentile because it's got about 13% below it. Yes? On the paper, it has these stars that are... Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, all right, we'll do one of those. Okay. Well, all right, let me just talk about that for a minute. Oh, no, no, I'm going to build up my way there. Okay. Because that relates to a different kind of problem. Let's do another one, and then I'll do one related to that. Let me see what you guys think about this. So given a standard normal curve, I want to know the probability that... Well, let's just do this first. I'm not going to jump the gun too much. Z is greater than 0.16. So trust me on this. Draw the picture. I'm not going to take points off if you don't draw it, but the people that make the most mistakes are the people that don't draw the picture. So what goes in the middle? In this case, zero. In general, the mean goes in the middle. In this case, it's zero because we've already made everything z-scores. Where's 0.16, roughly? To the, yeah, to the right a little bit, 0.16. And then what area do you shade in? This area, because I want to be above. And real quick, if you have any trouble with inequalities, that's an arrow pointing that way. Yes, this way. Look at this way. Arrow pointing that way, so that's the way you shade. It's crazy. Okay. So now, if you look up 0.16, do you get the answer? What do you get? You, whenever you look up a z-score, the chart immediately tells you the area that is below what you looked up, correct? So look up 0.16. What do you get? What is it? Five, six, two, six. Okay, point one, six, five, six, three, six. One fish, two fish. Okay, five, six, three, six. Do you see I'm being nice to myself? I've drawn the picture. I've shaded the answer. I have put the minute I look up a Z score, it tells me the area below. So I know I'm not done yet because I don't know what this is, and that's the whole question. So what would this be? What's the whole thing? The whole thing has an area of one. So that side is five, six, three, six. So what's that side? Four, three, two, one. No, I'm joking. Yeah, four, three, six, four, eleven. Four, three, six, four. And I showed you guys the. I know you all have calculators, but I showed I showed you how to do this. By hand, did I? Make it nine, make it nine, make it nine, make it ten. Okay. Now, is everybody cool with what just happened? No. Where did I lose you? You got to tell me the minute I lose you. Where did I lose you? Are you cool with that number? So the z score is 0.5636. No, 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 no. What's the z score? 0.16. What's the probability that it's below that? 0.5636. This is a z-score. This is an area. As we just learned with the uniform curves, area equals probability. Yes? How did I find which one? 5636? If you look up 0 0.16, 0 0.16. Oh. Yes. You guys see that? And again, what does this chart tell us? It tells us the area below the z-score we look up. So any z-score you look up, that's an area below that z-score. Why did I have more work in this damn problem? Because it didn't ask me for an area below, right? It asked me for an area above. So now, and please, dear God, if the answer is no, just say no. 
Is everybody okay with 5636? Okay, I can see in some of your eyes you're not, but nobody's saying that, okay. If that side's 5636, the other side must be the rest. One minus that. Now let me see if you guys, eat. so do you see how that problem's done? And if you're gonna do this for homework, you better freaking box that sucker off so I know what the answer is, right? So the answer is 4364, and if you want to, you can make it 43.64%. So if heights are normally distributed, what's the probability somebody has a Z-score height above 0.16? 43.64%. Now, real quick, look up negative 0.16. 4, 3, 6, 4, right? And real quick, you don't have to understand what I just did because we finished the problem. The problem is done. But isn't the area above this the same as the area below negative 0.16 because of symmetry. So there's a little tiny shortcut there that you never have to use if you don't understand it. It's okay. But there's a little shortcut to some of these problems. All right. Last one for today. And the next time I'm going to have a big uh, worksheet to kind of, but today we're just getting used to just how the hell does this damn thing work, period. So I'm not gonna quite get to the thing you're talking about. Next time we'll do the star. Um, what about the probability that Z is between, oh shit, between negative 2.98 and 1.17? Yes. Very special numbers that I just came up out of nowhere. Okay. First thing, just draw, just draw it. Shade in the area I want. Draw it, indicate all the stuff, shade in the area that I want. Oh, see this might be too late to say this for some of you guys, but I can give you another copy. You're gonna be using these Z-score charts on quizzes and tests. So the most you can have on there is like your name. Does that make sense? If you've already written all over it, just let me know, I can give you a fresh one or something. Um, because if I see any other markings, I don't know if that's a little cryptic message to yourself. I don't want to see any notes. Does that make sense? Because when you take a test or something, you're going to bring up your Z-score chart so I can look at it, and then you can go about your business, right? Okay. What goes in the middle? Good. And then I got 1.17. And I got negative 2.98. It doesn't matter exactly how far away or anything. You just need a visual anchor. That's got to be over here. That's got to be over there. So there's the answer, just not specific enough. I've got two freaking Z scores. If you look up 1.17, can you guys, anybody do that for me? Look up 1.17. Just look it up. What do you guys get? What is it? Sorry? 8790. So that is the area below what I just looked up, correct? Is that too much or too little for the answer? Is that is that bigger or smaller than the actual answer I want? Bigger. Do you guys see? Because it didn't stop here, did it? It kept going. Damn it. I need to cut off exactly this much area. How do I find that area? Bless you. You look up that, right? So if I ask you for the probability between two things, you look up the two z-scores and you subtract the areas. Because the bigger z-score, if you look it up, it's too much. It should have stopped right there, but it keeps going forever. So if I just cut off this much, I'll end up with between those two. Does that make physical sense? Okay, one person says yes, okay. Nobody said no, so I guess that's a win. So negative 2.98, I get 0014. So 
So then if I subtract those two, I get 0 0.8, 7, 7, 6 maybe? Yay. Okay, there's no shortcut for that, sorry. So real quick, why would you never subtract two z-scores? What does the z-score tell you again? Yeah, so basically, this would not be good enough for an answer in a test, but it basically tells you where your data point is, correct? And number standard B, blah, blah. If I subtract two z-scores, I'm somewhere else entirely now. Does that make sense? So you never subtract z-scores, you subtract errors. So next time we'll have a, a handout, we'll have a lot of practice problems. And uh, a week from today, we'll have that quiz on chapter four. Okay. All right, guys. Don't forget your keys and such.